Romans chapter 6, we are down to the very end of the chapter here today. Romans chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 21. It's almost a forgotten concept today, something that you don't hear a whole lot about anymore. That is loyalty. There was a time when employers were expected to be loyal to their employees and vice versa. There was a time, maybe you remember it, when co companies gave loyal customer discounts, right? Where they gave the discounted rate to the person that had been their customer for a long time instead of the discounted rate to the new person they were trying to hook and charging all the regular customers a higher rate than the new customers. Once loyalty to people and to institutions and to ideas was praised, now it's not much talked about, but the concept is still there. We still have our loyalties that show up in the inclinations of our thoughts and behaviors. And while blind loyalty is a very dangerous thing, loyalty itself can be very positive because it gives stability and it is grounded in relationship. It should be examined, however. Who are we loyal to and why? Are they deserving of our loyalty? Or is there someone or something else to whom we should be loyal instead? In our spiritual lives, we have two potential masters calling for our loyalty, desiring our obedience day in and day out. And the choice of whom to serve is not one that we have to, nor should we make blindly. We have dealt with both of these masters in the past, and so we can compare how they have treated us and see which is more deserving of our allegiance. Over the last couple weeks, we've seen those two masters, righteousness in the person of Jesus Christ and sin, which we served before we came to Christ. All of us were under sin, condemned by the law, by conscience, by morality, by religion. We all came short of the glory of God and the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against all the things we did when we lived under the control of sin. Sin claims our loyalty by birth and by choice. And so sin calls upon us to just keep on doing all the things we used to do, the way we always did, the way everybody around us does. But then Jesus came. He, God himself, came in human flesh, died for our sins. His precious blood paid the terrible bill we had run up in years of disobeying God. Then he rose from the dead. He did absolutely everything that needed to be done and everything that could be done to save our souls. And he invites us to come to him by faith and only by faith. And then he lays claim to our loyalty. Just as sin lays claim to our loyalty by birth and by choice and by habit and by the world around us, so Jesus Christ calls for us to be loyal to him by his blood, his death, his resurrection, his grace, and his salvation. We've been placed into Christ, and that means we're dead to sin. We've seen that in the previous verses, and we are risen to a new life. But what that new life means right now is that we have the power to live for God and we can choose to do that. God commands us to think like that, to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to him. He commands us to yield ourselves to him and righteousness, not to sin. But God often gives explanation and reason where he gives command. He doesn't demand blind faith, but rather helps us to see with the eyes of faith. Now as we reach the end of the chapter, having heard the facts and received the commands, he reasons with us. Why should we live for him? Well, he's commanded it, he's given the order, but is there a reason beyond just a yes sir obedience to God that we should be doing this? Why should we trouble ourselves to live differently, to take the Bible and its commands seriously, to devote ourselves to the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Why should we be different than everybody else, inconvenience ourselves, enter into that suffering and self-denial that is living for Jesus Christ when our flesh wants what sin wants? Well, the answer he gives lies in how our two potential masters have treated us. Verse 21 of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So God has always looked to the heart 
to our motivations, not just at what we do, but at why we do it. And so he reasons with us about why we live our lives the way we do. Why, he asks, would you sin? Why would you disobey his commands? Why would you deviate from his character? Why would we do things that are wrong? Well, there's a couple possibilities why we might serve another master other than God. One possibility is that we just don't have a choice. We're overpowered, we're overwhelmed, we're overcome, and we can't help doing what's wrong. Well, that's one reason why you might serve a master, right? He puts a gun to your head and says, do this, and you say, okay, I don't really have a choice here, I have to do it. I've been overpowered. But he's already dealt with that earlier in the passage. We are not overpowered by sin. We can never be overpowered by sin. This world can't overcome us. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. Jesus says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He says that he that's dead is freed from sin and we're dead with Christ and we're risen to walk with him in newness of life. We can't use that excuse for sin, that we just can't help it, didn't really have a choice, we were overpowered. That one's already done away with. So what's the second reason why we might serve someone or work for them? Well, that would be because we like what we get from them. We like the outcome. Why do you go to your job? You like the paycheck, probably. I mean, hopefully you enjoy the work and all of that, but most people go to a job on a consistent basis because they like having a paycheck. They like what they get from what they do for the person they do it for. And fortunately, we have freedom and we're able to have different bosses. And if we have a bad enough boss, we can choose a different boss and go to work for that one and still get a paycheck and all of that. But bottom line is, that's the other reason why you might do what someone else tells you, because you like what you get from them. You appreciate that master, you appreciate that boss, and you like what you get from that boss, whether it is respectful treatment in the workplace or a larger paycheck than someplace else or nice benefits or bonuses or whatever. You like what you get from that boss, so you work for them. So God calls us to look back to when we serve sin. So what fruit did you have back then? What did it do for you? What did it bring you? Now, he notes that these are things that you're now ashamed of. You know, we should be ashamed of the sins that dominated us before we were saved. We shouldn't glory in them, and we certainly shouldn't linger in them. Uh, You know, you hear people talk sometimes about their lives before they trusted Christ or got right with God, and it's, it's almost like they're bragging sometimes about how bad a sinner they were and how much fun it was, and, and that's not the way it should be. Now, there is a place for recounting who we were before we came to Christ, for recognizing who we would be if we were not in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul repeatedly tells people his testimony, shares with them what he had been and what he had done before he got saved. But the value in that is in seeing how God has changed us, how different we are with him than we would be without him. When we look back on sin, we should recognize what our sins cost Jesus Christ to atone for, how they offended a holy God, how they hurt us and the people around us. If we truly believe that what we did was wrong, that it was sin that Jesus had to die for, that Jesus had to rise victorious over, and that we had to be saved from, then that should result in some shame not in glorying in it or lingering in it. So he says that that stuff you are ashamed of, that stuff Jesus had to die for, that stuff that was wrecking your life and hurting the people around you, and what fruit did you have in that? He says, well, the end of those things is death. What did sin ever do for you? What is its fruit? Well, it destroyed the world, basically. When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, sin resulted in the deaths of every person who has ever died upon this earth. Sin is the source of every sickness and suffering and injustice and cruelty this world knows. Sin is the sole reason why each of us will someday go to a grave barring the return of Jesus Christ. So what fruit? Did you have from all those things that you did before you got saved? Those things that you did when you weren't right with God? Those things that the world around us does? What fruit? What did that really in the final analysis do for you? 
It kills you. That's what it does. It kills you and everyone you love and everything you know. It only ever brings death. Well, it makes the death look good for a little bit, but that's ultimately the outcome. James chapter 1, verses 14 to 16 address this. In James 1, 14 to 16, he says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. There will never come long-term good from doing bad. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. The end of those things is death. See, sin wants to blind us with stuff that's not at the end yet. It wants to make promises at the beginning, but at the end, it was always a lie. Sin, sourced in Satan, comes from the father of lies. It deceives. It says this is going to be fun. It says this is going to be good for you. It says this is going to work out well for your family. It says this is how you can be more secure. This is how you can be more prosperous. This is how you can be more happy. This is how you die. Because it always only brings death in the end. While sin might seem to have positive effects or experiences in the short term, it always betrays us in the long run. Now, God is so good and so mighty that he, in his foreknowledge and providence and grace and mercy, manages to work through and redeem even many of our sins and mistakes, bringing beauty from ashes. But he achieves that not because the sin was good or because this was a better way of doing things, but because that very sin brought his son to the agonizing death of the cross, and thus he can redeem. But what did it cost for that redemption? It cost death. The end of those things is death. If we're really honest about our past and about our future, we recognize that sin never has and never will in the end do anything good for us. The end that it always brings is death. Well, now he draws a contrast, okay? That was master one, sin. Here's your second choice. But now, verse 22 of Romans 6, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So the fruit of our decision to trust Christ, that's what set us free from, Christ, from sin, not our works or efforts. The end of that is holiness and the end everlasting life. Now that's as great a contrast from sin as you could possibly look for. Sin leaves you in unrighteousness. Christ places you into holiness. Sin leads you to death. Christ gives you everlasting life. This is a holiness that we could never earn or produce on our own. And the end of faith and holiness, well, it's everlasting life. The thing that would keep us from everlasting life, our unrighteousness, is dealt with by Christ as he gives us holiness, the holiness of God. When we are reckoned like God because we are placed into Jesus Christ, we are holy, set apart to God. And those set apart to God in Jesus Christ have everlasting life. They live forever, like Jesus lives forever. They are in Him. They have His life. And once we're in Christ, that is unconditional because something everlasting can't ever end. With sin, all we ever had to look forward to was death. With Christ, everything we have to look forward to is life. We were the servants of sin. Now we are bought with a price and we are become servants to God. And in that standing, sin didn't really give us a choice, but God does for now. We have the choice whether to serve sin or whether to serve our rightful master, the Lord, who died for us, bought us with his blood, set us free with the mighty power of his resurrection, justified us, redeemed us, and has given us eternal life. Well, we believe this is true in a theoretical sense. Okay, yes, I, I'm saved now. I have everlasting life. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That's wonderful. Uh, but do we let that affect how we live in a practical sense? So now we come to verse 23, Romans 6, 23. 
For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now this verse, man, it's a famous verse. It's one that the Iwana kids learn real early. And, and, you know, we used to, as part of the Romans Road, a lot of the time to try to lead people to Christ, to persuade people to believe in Jesus Christ. And we tell them based on this verse that they have sinned, and that's true. And their sin can only bring them death, and that's true. And we tell them God will give them eternal life if they will believe on Jesus Christ, and that's true too. But you know, this verse isn't really about persuading people to get saved. Not in the context here. The same truths that we use to persuade people to get saved, to trust Christ, should be used to persuade us to live for Christ once we are saved. Grounded in those same truths about sin and death and Christ and life is the key to how we live this life. So then there is his conclusion. All we would ever end up with from sin is death. But God gives everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice the contrast. Sin gives you what you earn. It has wages. You commit the sin, then you get the wage. You do the job, then you get the paycheck. You earn the death that you receive from sin. Sin never gave you anything you didn't earn. You know, it was pretty upfront about the, the price tag, or at least God was. Sin might not have been, but God was pretty upfront about the price tag on that. And... You did the job, you get the paycheck, you earn death. But God did it differently. First, he gave us the gift. Then he asks us to serve him. We serve sin and then we die. Jesus Christ gives us life and then we serve. And this is why salvation is simply through faith. It's a gift. It cannot be earned or it wouldn't be a gift. He, he gives us the gift of God. And, and it's an offense to that, by the way, to try to think that we can work for it, earn it, deserve it, that we have to do something to get it. That's, that's kind of insulting to the person who's giving you the gift to try to earn it from them instead. This is a free gift, and the way we receive that gift is simply by faith, by believing in Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Where sin would reward our service with death, God just gave us us for nothing, for us doing nothing for him, for us deserving nothing from him. God just gave us everlasting life, not because we were good, but because he is good. That's why he gave it to us. James 1.17, I read verses 14 to 16 a few minutes ago about where death comes from, sin. It all starts inside of us. We, we're tempted and we're drawn away of our own lust. Lust brings forth sin. Sin brings forth death. But the very next verse, verse 17, draws such a contrast. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing we have was given to us by God. It's quite a difference, isn't it? So much that we have is undeserved, unmerited, unearned. A gift from the Father of lights, who doesn't change, who doesn't turn. He is steadfast, eternal in his goodness. Every bit of goodness and beauty that is in this world is from his hand. It's how the world got to be the way that it is. God created everything very good. Man sinned, and with that sin, we brought corruption and death into this world, and then God had to judge, and that judgment brought the death and the, the suffering and all the, the problems and bad that's in this world. I asked it Wednesday night, people say, how can you believe that God is good when there is so much bad in the world? But the uh, corollary should be asked as well, how can you believe God is bad if there's so much good in the world? Every good thing comes from God. And chief in all of that is Jesus Christ and eternal life in Him. We've seen in Romans already how turning to Christ can give us peace and joy and hope. It's been said that all good things must come to an end. But that's not true of the blessings we have in Jesus. We have eternal life with our wonderful Lord in wonderful places with wonderful peace and joy. We who didn't deserve any of this 
were given all of it entirely by God's grace. That is the kind of master he is. He gives life where death has been earned, joy where misery is deserved, peace where only war was before, and he gives this abundant life and its blessings forever and ever. So here are the two masters who call for our loyalty, our allegiance, our obedience. Let's look at how they've treated us as we choose which one we're going to serve. We are rightly the servants of God, for we are bought with a price, the precious blood of God's own Son. But rather than forcing us to do His will, He has truly set us free and given us a choice. Choose based on what these two masters do for us. What has sin ever done for you? It enslaves you. It takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. It gives you a few moments of pleasure, having baited with that pleasure the hook of death. In the long run, sin never does anything good for anyone. And then there's God and His righteousness. Where sin enslaved, Christ set us free. Where sin gives a few moments pleasure and then eternal death, Christ brings us through suffering and gives us everlasting life. We love Him because He first loved us. He showed us his love by what he has given. God the Father gave his Son. God the Son gave himself. Together they give us eternal life. Why would we choose sin? Why? Day after day, temptation comes to us. We're drawn away of our own lust. What's seated inside our hearts and enticed. And we let that bring forth sin. Why do we do that? Because we aren't thinking like this. When that temptation comes, when we give in to that anger, light up that cigarette, act on that lust, tell that lie to make things easier or stay out of trouble, whatever it is that we do that the flesh is calling us to do in the lust of our flesh, the pride of life, the lust of our eyes, whatever it is that sin is calling us to do, when we give in to it, it's because we're not thinking like this. It's because we're not thinking about where that ends. It ended on a cross with God himself bleeding and dying for that sin. We're not thinking about the death that sin led to. We're not thinking about the life, the eternal life, that the one who has saved us from that sin has already given us. We're not thinking about the joy and peace and hope that we have in him. We're just thinking about what we want right then, how it feels right now, instead of looking at the end, instead of looking at the fruit. When we give in to sin, we're not looking at wrecked relationships and bodies and minds and lives. We're not thinking about where it's going to end up. We're listening to its promises of pleasure without remembering its destiny of death. And when we don't live for Jesus Christ, when we don't put him first, when we choose not to think on the things he wants us to think on and live like he has commanded us to live, it's because we aren't thinking about what he's done for us, what he's given to us, what we have to look forward to in him. We aren't thinking in that moment about God being tortured to death to save our lives so that we would live them for him. We aren't thinking about living forever, joy, peace, and hope. We're blinded instead by the lies of sin. So don't live in blind loyalty to what you've lived for before before you came to Christ, before you were set free from sin. Have your eyes opened. See with the eyes of faith. Look at where sin was taking you and say, should I do that? Should I live once again for a thing that in the end was only going to wreck, ruin, destroy, and kill? I know it's doesn't look as good on the surface here. I know it doesn't sound like as much fun or might not get me as far ahead, but should I live for the thing, for the one who's given me everlasting life already when I hadn't even earned it or deserved it? He already gave it to me. Which master? Which master would I want to serve? The one who was going to kill me or the one who gave me life? This is a decision we make from day to day. This is not a decision that gets made 
one time, and then you're all done with it. This is day by day. We have to frame and choose the way that we think if we are going to choose the way that we live. And so he calls us to look at the end. When you plant that seed, look at the fruit that's going to grow from it. What will it be? Sin unto death or righteousness unto life? Let's choose our allegiance and our loyalties wisely.